Welcome, uh, Honorable Chief Guest Sri B V R Subramaniam, CEO Niti Aayog. As I invite you, sir, to kindly grace the stage with your august presence. Also inviting our special guest, Mr. Ashutosh Gupta, Country Manager, LinkedIn India, Mr. Shailesh K. Patak, Secretary General, Fiki, Dr. Vidya Yaravdekar, Chair, Fiki Higher Education Committee, and Professor Savik Bhattacharya, Co-Chair, Fiki Higher Education Committee. Namaskar and good morning. Honorable Chief Guest, Sri B. V. R. Subramaniam, CEO Niti Aayog, eminent dignitaries on the days, special invitees, senior officials, distinguished dignitaries and delegates, respected members of the press and media, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the inaugural session of the 18th FIKI Higher Education Summit 2023, a global conference and exhibition on the theme, Empowering Minds, Driving Transformation, Redefining the Future of Higher Education, which is being organized by FIKI in support with the Ministry of Education, Government of India. Ladies and gentlemen, over the years, the FIKI Higher Education Summit has evolved into a thought leadership forum for the global education ecosystem that brings together key stakeholders, including the policy makers, administrators, educationists, industry and students for facilitating collaborations, deliberations and knowledge sharing. The summit this year will witness participation of national and international delegates and exhibitors from top of the line Indian and foreign institutions, focused B2B meetings and a football of approximately 1800 visitors in the exhibition. And ladies and gentlemen, today, the presence of eminent dignitaries is a source of inspiration for all of us. I would now like to request Mr. Shailesh Pathak, Secretary General Fiki, to kindly welcome and honor our honorable chief guest with the green certificate. The green certificate, ladies and gentlemen, is a Fiki initiative, wherein a grove of six trees will be planted for ecotourism in Masuri, Uttarakhand, in the name of the honorable chief guest. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you, sir, for doing the honors. Thank you. I would now request Dr. Vidya Yarvedeka, Chair FIKI Higher Education Committee, to kindly present a green certificate to our special guest, Mr. Ashutosh Gupta, Country Manager, LinkedIn India. A warm welcome to you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last one and a half decades, Piki has become a thought leader in higher education and has contributed immensely by submitting several thought-provoking knowledge papers that includes the Fiki Vision 2030 for higher education, state-focused roadmap to India's Vision 2030, future of jobs and its implication in higher education, and leapfrogging in education 4.0. The FIKI Higher Education Vision 2030 paper has given direction to several educational reforms and is reflected in the National Education Policy 2020. Several of the regulations and announcements of the government, such as the UGC Graded Autonomy Regulation 2018, Institute of Eminence and Study in India, have emanated from various discussions at FIKI forums and the knowledge papers. May I now invite Dr. Vidya Yaravdekar, Chair FIKI Higher Education Committee and Pro-Chancellor Symbiosis International University to kindly begin the proceedings with the welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome them. The Chief Guest for the inaugural ceremony of the FIKI Higher Education Summit uh, 2023. Shri B. V. R. Subramaniam, CEO Niti Ayog. The guest of honor, Mr. Gupta. Our very own Mr. Shailesh Patak, Secretary General Fiki. My co-chair, Sauvik. Dignitaries sitting here in the audience, faculty members, university leaders, and my dear members of Fiki Higher Education Committee. It gives me great pleasure, sir, to welcome you, and thank you very much for accepting this invitation. In fact, sir was supposed to give the keynote address at 11.30, but I requested him that at the inaugural, it will be fit to have his keynote uh, address at the inaugural session. 
and thank you very much for readily accepting our invitation. As the compare very rightly said that this is the 18th higher education summit that we are hosting. And fortunately, I've been a part of all the 18 summits, not as chair, of course, but certainly as someone sitting there in the audience listening to these wonderful deliberations and discussions. And what intrigued me then and even now is that there has been a lot of advocacy that Fiki has done in the higher education space, and we are so fortunate that many of these advocacies were implemented as policies uh, in the Government of India or the Ministry of Education policies that came out. And I think one of the most interesting was the national education policy that came out in 2020. And just before that, a few years before that, we had submitted a, a white paper, or I would say a, a compendium, to the Ministry of Education. And we feel so happy that a large part of it was included in the national education policy. And as I always say in many of my deliberations, that uh, the national education policy, therefore, feels as if it belongs to each one of us. There was so much of stakeholder uh, consultations done, and Fiki was one of the major stakeholders. I still remember doc interactions with Dr. Kasturi Rangan in a closed door uh, room, uh, discussing and dis deliberating on various aspects during the drafting of the national education policy. Similarly, many other things, a lot on internationalization of higher education that we see today with so much of impetus has certainly come out of the discussions that took place during such higher education summits. Of course, uh, I'm disheartened that the number of foreign students still haven't increased, sir, and there are several reasons for that. In fact, I we would certainly like to sit with you someday so that through Niti Ayog, maybe we could get a push to increase the number of international students against the Indian students that are going out to study. Another new uh, regulation that most of us, or some of us are excited and some of us are not really very happy, is about the foreign uh, university campuses on the Indian soil. You know, there are going to be you know, different discussions that would take place uh, informally and formally. Uh, but yes, once the foreign universities come here, though, of course, two of them are already there in Gift City. But really, Gift City doesn't affect us. Uh, we uh, have Mr. Sandeep Shah this afternoon who will be discussing this. But nevertheless, in the, the rest of India, I'm sure it's going to affect positively or negatively to the higher education sector. Of course, I'm very optimistic personally, and I feel it will be definitely a positive impact. Foreign uh, universities will come through collaborations and uh, very few will, of course, set up their own campuses. We all know how difficult it is for us to expand into other states. I'm sure it's going to be equally difficult for them. So they will find like-minded partners and collaborate with some of us. The other, uh, you know, the other issues that we discuss and deliberate, sir, are the rankings issues. You know, we always, uh, I mean, you all always wonder in the government, why are Indian institutions not being ranked, barring a few uh, who show up in the top 200, top 500, and why not many of us? And there are several reasons. Again, there are going to be a lot of discussions on benchmarking. One we had last evening as the Vice Chancellor's Roundtable, where we discussed a lot on how can Indian institutions be benchmarked against the best in the world. Is rankings the only parameter of benchmarking? In fact, some argued and said that is there a need of benchmarking against someone? Can you benchmark against yourself of how you've done earlier and what you would like to do? Can you create a goal setting for your own university? And how do you maintain the identity of Indian higher education vis-a-vis -vis, you know, the global higher education and still be a global uh, player in the higher education space. So that's another uh, you know, discussion point for all of us about rankings that you, we see so much all around us you know, in media. We all get bogged down with rankings. And then a reflection of rankings on research. Uh, you know, many of us wonder you know, the kind of research publications that have gone up humongously, which is of course something that we should feel happy about, but the way these publications have gone up is something I think all of us know, and uh, somewhere we need to ponder and say that, are we really giving uh, the due to the good teachers uh, you know, in the classrooms who do excellent teaching, for which students are happy, they get jobs because of this good teaching? Or are we skewed towards research because of this, you know, hanging sword of being the best uh, against someone, benchmarking ourselves against someone who's ranked, and, you know, that's the rat race that I think higher education institutions are playing. And then coming on to the burden or the role of the faculty, 
which you know which has to teach which has to administer and of course which also has to do research now some of the faculty would love to just do teaching and not do research and some of the faculty would just want to do research and not teaching how do we meet up with these challenges of a very young aspirational faculty which is also joining our university campuses it's no longer young students but you see young uh, phd scholars who want to take academics as a career can we create an ecosystem and a platform conducive for them a platform that can be conducive for both good teachers and good researchers can we really move on to you know these kind of uh, you know ecosystems on our university campuses and then of course topics like uh, you know funding of higher education we all know it's getting expensive uh, the kind of fees that we charge students is sometimes so mind boggling that people like you know my father's age who have been academicians you know uh, i mean when he looks at the fee structure of symbiosis he really gets angry but then what do you do you have to also meet up with the expenses and a huge amount of expenses of university campuses aspirational students who want the best of campuses the best of facilities uh, aspirational teachers who want obviously good salaries and you want teachers to move from academia, uh, from industry to academia, and so on and so forth. So these are challenges that also higher education institutions face. It's not just the corporate world, sir, but I think uh, we also must consider that you know when we have one of the largest higher education systems, uh, certainly the, you know the Niti Aayog, the Ministry of Commerce, and others should not just leave it to Ministry of Education, but certainly other ministries and think tanks must come in and discuss and deliberate to find out a good way of a, of a very conducive ecosystem and uh, you know an ecosystem that will have an identity of a, of a quality Indian higher education. So with these few words, I stop here and I welcome all the de delegates who've come here in large numbers and many who will arrive in the next few hours. And I once again thank you, sir, uh, for accepting our invitation and also Ashutosh, thank you for accepting our invitation of being here. Thank you very much indeed, ma'am, for those warm words of welcome and for setting the context for the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate to have with us today Mr. Ashutosh Gupta. Mr. Gupta is LinkedIn's India Country Manager since the year 2019, responsible for driving the next wave of growth for the business in the market. He continues to lead LinkedIn Marketing Solutions, online sales organizations for APAC, before which he played the defining role in scaling the LMS enterprise business for LinkedIn. An alumnus of the Indian Institute of Management, Lucknow, and Indian Institute of Technology, BHU Varanasi, Mr. Ashutosh has a diverse professional background. He has worked as a private equity manager and led sales at tech giants such as Google, Cognizant, and Infosys. As a member of the board of IAB, Southeast Asia and India, he proactively contributed to building a positive perception and growth for the digital industry within local, regional, and the global context. In addition to his career at LinkedIn, Mr. Ashutosh is also a charter member of the Indus Entrepreneurs, TIE, that has been serving on the Delhi Confederation of Indian Industry State Council for the past three years. And ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together as I invite Mr. Ashutosh Gupta for the special address. Good morning, uh, Mr. Subramaniam, uh, Dr. Vidya, Mr. Padak, distinguished guests, educators, and future leaders. It's a privilege to be here to today amongst the brightest minds of the country. And to honor this privilege, I want to share with you a vision of India, not just as a country, but a powerhouse in the global talent market. India is a country where every street is buzzing with the promise of innovation, where every young mind holds just not the dreams, but also the solutions for the world. We see uh, so many global CEOs coming from India. We see so many Indians in large institutions across the world uh, solving big problems, uh, building uh, great companies. And, uh, and that's, that's the dream all of us are living here in India. Uh, we are land brimming with potential, 
uh, standing at the forefront of the global talent supply and demand. I want to take this moment to remind us all of what makes us the land of opportunity. I think this has been discussed, but I just want to set this as a context because the things I'm going to say later part will help us. These data points will help. So first of all, demographic advantage. We are home to the world's largest youth population. This is just not a demographic advantage. It's a reservoir of untapped potential, uh, ready to redefine global talent dynamics. Innovation hub. India is rapidly becoming a, a hub for innovation and entrepreneurship. Our cities are turning into vibrant startup ecosystems, attracting global attention and investment. Technological prowess. We, are strong, we have a strong foundation in technology and IT services. And India is poised to be a leader uh, in the digital economy and uh, shaping global tech trends, including the latest one which everybody is talking about, which is AI and Gen AI. Cultural diversity. Our cultural diversity is our strength. It fosters a unique perspective in problem solving, making Indian talent adaptable and versatile in global markets. And I speak for this from my own experience, having lived abroad, having worked in North America, and Singapore, I think the kind of cultural diversity we bring is very, very unique, and it's really a strength and a differentiator. Lastly, and not the least, education capital. We have a robust network of educational institutes, uh, and India has a, a potential to be the world's education capital, nurturing a generation of skilled professionals. So these are the things which makes us a land of opportunity. But as we stand, on the threshold of opportunity, we must confront a crucial question. Are our current systems of education enough to harness the potential which we are seeing? The honest answer is that while our education systems have laid a very strong foundation, we need to work together to evolve them further. Today's world is increasingly moving towards a skills-first mindset. I'll repeat, skills-first mindset. This is the most important thing we have to consider and think about the future, and I'm gonna talk a little more about it. The traditional approach of book-based learning, while fundamental, needs to evolve further. The future belongs to those who can apply knowledge practically, who can innovate, adapt, and solve real-world problems. This is where India's journey must take a transformative leap. Our demographic dividend, the force behind our rise, is primarily composed of the younger generation. To empower them, we must shift our educational focus from holistic knowledge acquisition to wholesome skill development. At LinkedIn, we are committed to fostering the skills-first mindset. It's something which we as a company uh, truly believe in, and this is a global thinking and very, very relevant for India as well. Uh, it's a mindset that measures talent, not just by academic degrees, but by the ability to perform, to turn theory into practice. I call this potential over pedigree, right? You know, you have to really nurture the potential which every student has. Let me share some insights which we are seeing on our platform that tells us a compelling truth about how our youth is future-proofing their career paths on our platform, some very early trends which we are seeing on LinkedIn India. In, our, in the last year alone, uh, the student signups on LinkedIn India have increased by 73%. But what's more telling is the nature of the engagement. What these students are doing on the platform is very, very much telling about what they, how they are thinking about the future and how they're shaping their future. Gen Z, our most dynamic demographic, spend significantly more time acquiring uh, practical skills than any previous generation. In LinkedIn India is number one globally in LinkedIn ecosystem on knowledge seeking behavior. What is knowledge seeking behavior? Knowledge seeking behavior is when I want to learn from others when I want to learn from people who have the experience, who have the knowledge, and that knowledge is being shared on the LinkedIn platform. And we are seeing that that 
particular posts, those particular nuggets of information are the most heavy, en heavily engaged on the platform. Uh, Gen Zs are, most, are more likely to network with other professionals and engage with career pages on the platform, which proves that they're already challenging the traditional routes, routes to success. They're opting for more ambitious and purpose-driven career paths, learning niche soft skills, and hunting for opportunities that best align with their values. This tells us that our youth is just not preparing for the future, they're shaping it. In a world constantly shaped, uh, reshaped by macroeconomic shifts and technological advancements, especially AI, the relevance of traditional knowledge uh, needs to evolve. We need to really, really work hard to, uh, to, to, to reshape the traditional knowledge thinking and what it means in the current context. I just want to remind that AI is not our competitor. It's our collaborator. It's a tool that amplifies, that makes us productive, that helps us realize human potential. So we must embrace AI, not resist it, not resist it for it will play a pivotal, pivotal role in shaping uh, the future of work. As decision makers and educators, it is our responsibility to align our education systems with these evolving realities. We need to move beyond the confines of conventional classrooms and test textbooks to embrace a more hands-on skills-first approach. Higher education is the architect of tomorrow's workforce. It's been a fortress of opportunity for decades. Going forward, it must evolve to meet the needs of this diverse, agile, and resilient global economy. We must focus on nurturing not just technical prowess, but also essentially the soft skills like communication and problem solving. Before I came here, we were having a small conversation and I was emphasizing the needs of soft skills. Hard skills, absolutely important, but what we learn when we come together as a cohort, when we go to schools, when we go to colleges, when we do courses, is the learning which we get from the peers and the cohort and the soft skills we learn. When I went to IIM Lucknow, of course, I learned valuable hard skills, but the soft skills, the soft skills of collaboration, soft skills of problem solving. In the world of AI, not even problem solving, problem identification. Where does the problem lie? What is the problem? Those are the skills which should be valued, right? So I think hard skills, definitely, but soft skills will be the premium because some of the hard skills, some of the, some of the things which can be done through the hard skills probably will be done by some of the uh, machines or some of the AI stuff, right? So, uh, you know, soft skills, super important. And then we look at the new skills which are coming up, sustainability and green talent. These are no longer optional. They are imperative and demand for this powerful domains of work and education is only going to surge to greater heights in the near future. Our recent ach achievements in global education rankings are just the beginning by re redefining higher education through a lens of skills, knowledge, and inclusivity, we can, only, we can not only elevate our education system, but also make it a strong global benchmark. We have the skills, we have the talent, and the vigor to achieve this. And I'm confident that if we all work together, we can ensure that our future of education converges with the future of new employable skills. So in closing, I would like to say that in symphony of our country's progress, every young Indian mind is a note that harmonizes the future. Let's compose a masterpiece together. Let's come together as champions of the skills first approach. Let's commit to transforming our education system to empower our youth with the skills and mindset they need to thrive in an ever changing world. Together, we can pave the way for a future where India's talent not only meet global demand, which sets new standards of excellence. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for that enlightening special address. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have the proud privilege in inviting and requesting Secretary General Fiki, Sri Shailesh K. Patak for the keynote address. Please put your hands together to welcome, sir.
आप सबको बहुत धन्यवाद डिग्नेटरीज ऑन द डाय स्पेशली सी ई ओ नीति आयोग वी ऑल लुक अप टू हिम फॉर इज एरुडिशन एंड विजडम मिस्टर बी वी आर सुब्रमण्यम आर स्पेशल गेस्ट दिस इवनिंग लिंक इन कंट्री मैनेजर आशुतोष गुप्ता जी आर ओन कॉलीग्स इन द फिकी कमिटी डॉक्टर विद्या येरावडेकर एंड प्रोफेसर शौविक भट्टाचार्य dignitaries allowed us them in the dais and uh, ladies and gentlemen i am going to actually talk to the people who are basically under 25 in the audience those under 25 please raise your hands yeah thank you your generation is going to shape india right and let me begin with two numbers there is a northern neighbor of india where there used to be 16 million births in one year 1.6 crore children were born every year in 2017 how do we know this because a fiki member set up a factory for newborn medical devices in our northern neighbor 2017 they set up a factory and on the basis of projections that 1.6 crore uh, babies born in uh, 2017 some 1% 5% growth last year the number of births came down from 16 million to 9 million matlab 1.6 crore se ghatke 90 lakh ho gaya that country is going to run out of students for schools think of it aaj se 10 saal baad there will be empty schools in that country thankfully that's not going to happen in india that's going to happen in india not before uh, 2060 uh, when our growth rate starts declining in population and therefore the appropriate question to ask is when you under 25 people who are basically the customers of higher education when you go into higher education what is the higher education institution giving you and with all due respect to all these distinguished academics here i went to shri ram college of commerce in delhi university which is highly regarded i went to indian institute of management calcutta which is highly re regarded in both i did not learn any skills which i would use in my employment actually no i learned double entry at bookkeeping in in srcc i learned management by exception in i am cal so but i learned much more from my peer group and you know on on stage we have this uh, uh uh broad stream of campus based education represented by vidya ji and technology based education represented by linkedin but can we transform all our education into tech tech based education this peer learning this social skills and and you mentioned soft skills soft skills is so important when we look at potential employers under 25s you can google everything knowledge is not important but can you work in teams can you listen to people can you think that is the skill that we are looking for as employers not whether you know what, what is the capital of portugal google uh, baba has solved that issue the two institutions of higher learning that i actually enjoyed and which really taught me specific skills that i would use in in my job was the lal bahadur shastri national academy of administration which trained us for jobs in the government very very specific skills and i really enjoyed going to oxford university on a course on leadership and innovation because then i learned that there are these inventors and there are these business people inventors don't speak business people's language and these guys don't know how inventors work and the art of innovation is converting ideas to cash flow there are millions of ideas in this world most of them go to the graveyard without any commercial uh, uh, usage it is the few ideas that are converted into cash flow that is what fikis members do that is what business is all about but on the topic today the shocking and shameful realization that we all should have in this room 
is that almost all English medium schools, highly regarded English medium schools in all major cities, are basically a finishing factory for US and European universities. I know these schools where the entire batch starts preparing for applications of American universities from class 11. And it is not because they would love to go to the US. And incidentally, most of them go to not very highly ranked uh, colleges. And most of them come back starting looking for a job in India. And poor these Indian children, they go to a cold environment and they start having mental health issues. A lot of uh, uh, these children, when they come back as 21, 25 year olds, they're actually cut off from Indian roots. So it's how can we improve the supply of higher education in India is the question. So therefore the question is, is higher education in India fit for purpose? Actually, that's a good question to ask. Apart from a few outstanding institutions of excellence of higher education, given a choice, would you 25-year-olds, would you go to a substandard higher education uh, uh, institution in India or a tier two, tier three institution if you get a scholarship in the US? Obviously, the answer is clear. And we are delighted that the National Education Policy 2020 actually has a very effective blueprint to do something about higher education in India. And this report that we are going to release today has four broad uh, uh, issues that they have highlighted. Issue number one is quality education. And we'll, we'll hear more about that in the next couple of days. And this is, as you know, FIKI has been aligned with the excellence in higher education for more than 15, 18 years. So we are very concerned because the future of India is going to depend on the future of employees and the the quality of employees is going to depend on what you learn in college and higher education so coming back to what uh, uh, was said it is skills not a four year degree where you are taught uh, iska beta ye tha and and this happened in year nonsense that is all googleable how can you learn employable skills the second is industry alignment and here i would like to say this on behalf of private sector industry, I spent 19 years, I've been a CEO in a company. Believe me, most things that you guys learn are not relevant for what we need. But why is there this lack of dialogue between higher education institutions of excellence and the people who employ them? I have also been a director of an academic institution and we had specific round tables with potential employers saying this is our curriculum, how do you think we should change it? This should happen at every single institution of higher learning. Ultimately, you're fulfilling a supply of quality manpower to someone who's going to will, uh, uh, pay for that manpower. What is this you know, arrogance that only we know what industry wants? Talk to the industry. The third is research and innovation. I've been uh, on the uh, boards of uh, management institutes where when I suggested that the faculty has to have at least two consulting assignments every year, and that is how you keep in touch with the market. The faculty said, oh, but how can we do this? That means you are not market driven. Where is the research and innovation? And from the private sector, I can say that when researchers come to us, they are not solving our problem. They are working on their own agenda. Why should we fund it? So this communication between academia, research, and industry is something that I have asked the FIKI team prioritize over everything else. That is where we lose out. And industry academia collaboration, research and industry collaboration is something that we all need to work on. Um, let me leave you with a sobering thought. We are very proud that we are the third largest, uh, the fifth uh, largest economy currently having overtaken UK. All that under 25s in the audience, you do realize that we have 130 crore people and UK has six crore people. With six crore, they can generate a GDP of 2.5 trillion US, and we, with 130 crores, need to do that, which basically means that our productivity per person is horrendous. 
And how do you increase productivity? There are two ways that India will grow. One is by increasing the number of people. So every new family needs a refrigerator. That is population and demographics driven growth. The other is technology driven growth. And we are standing here in 2023. A lot of people do not realize that by 2033, quite a bit of what we do in higher education would have shifted to the technology domain, whether we like it or not. It is like UPI. UPI has replaced cash. By 2033, we will see this change. How are the people under 25 in this audience preparing for this change is the question. And, and you know, one of the suggestions I had for government was so many youth in this country are wasting their youth writing the civil service examination. 99% of them will not make it. They will take five attempts, 10 attempts. At the age of 33, 35, they'll realize that they won't be able to make it and then their life is a big dilemma. So why is this there a requirement that you have to be a graduate for the civil service examination? If you're testing through an exam, Nobody needs to uh, uh, submit a certificate that you're, you're a graduate if you write the GMAT. So one small decision by the UPSC saying that graduation is not required, this is the minimum age, we're having an exam, you, make, uh, you succeed in the exam, you make it. That will you know, remove these hordes of unemployable graduates in India who are quite frankly not equipping them with skills that they need in their life. Lastly, I was in a, a, a brainstorming over the weekend in Pune. And you know, the, the question that was asked was, which is the most successful example of higher education in India? The answer was quota coaching classes. Because there is a demand. And that demand is being met by a supply. We may laugh at quota coaching classes, but the the future is more important than the past. And, and I don't know what's going to happen in 2033 and 2047. But I'm sure of only one thing. Mahatma Gandhi came for the annual general meeting of FIKI in, in 1931. That was our fourth AGM. Um, we're going to have our 96th AGM next week in Vigyan Bhavan. In 2047, FIKI will celebrate an AGM where we will talk about how India's higher education adapted with the times, and we have a great productive workforce. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for that insightful and motivating keynote address. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now request our honorable chief guest to kindly do the honors of releasing the FIKI EY report. I would also like to invite on stage Dr. Avantika Tomer, Partner EY, partner on for the release of the report. And let's put our hands together on the release of the FIKI EY knowledge report. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for doing the honors. Thank you. Dr. Avantika for joining us. You may kindly be seated. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have the honor of having amongst us Sri BVR Subramanyam, CEO Niti Aayog. He is an Indian Administrative Service Officer of 1987 batch, Chhattisgarh Kader, has held important assignments over the last three decades in Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Jammu and Kashmir, along with a stint at the World Bank. He has been Secretary in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Chief Secretary Jammu and Kashmir, Principal Secretary, Government of Chhattisgarh, and held positions in the Prime Minister's office. And ladies and gentlemen, I have the proud privilege in inviting you, sir, for the inaugural address. Please put your hands together to welcome, sir. Dr. Vidya Yarvarkar. Sailesh Pathak, other dignitaries on the dais, uh, distinguished invitees. I'm extremely happy to be here at the FIKI's uh, 
two-day uh, seminar on uh, higher education in India. Uh, I was here last year also, and uh, when I was asked by Vidya to come over, I said, I will. And, and uh, education is my first love. I've spent three and a half years in Madhya Pradesh as a director of school education, and then Rajanik education program. I spent five years in the Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy of Masuri as a faculty member. And therefore, and if I'd been asked what job would I would have liked to retire as, I would have liked to retire as the director of the Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy. Uh, life had other things in store for me, you know. Uh, God always decides not to give you the ones which you want. I mean, it's true for all of us. So I'm happy to be here with all of you. Uh, you, are, you are the people who will shape the country's future. There is no doubt about it. Um, uh, the students that you produce are going to the people are going to be the people who will run this country in the future, and therefore, I mean, you are extremely critical for any vision which we have of 2047. Amrit Kaal, as our honourable Prime Minister says, Amrit Kaal will be shaped by your hands, and I think that's the critical role that you have. Education is transformative. I mean, at school level you get a foundation, and at the college level you get you're equipped with the skills and the capabilities that make you successful in life later on. And I think that's very, very important. It prepares the youth for the future. It equips them for the future. And there, as a couple of my colleagues have said earlier, I mean, we are at some interesting points in history. We have become the world's most populous nation. It's a matter of pride, but also a challenge. You know, this demographic dividend can also become a demographic burden if you don't handle it well. So I think that's very, very important. You're very young. Your median age is 29. That means half the people in India are below 29 years of age. The median age in China is 39. And you've just heard the problem which China is facing. 2047, our median age will be 39. So we should remember, we don't have too much time. 25 years may look long, but it's 75 years since independence. Time flies. And 25 years will pass very fast. So we have just this window of 25 years to actually exploit the demographic potential that is there in front of us. That, that, that means a lot, and that leads to a lot of reflection that we need to do. We have come a long way since 1947. I mean, if you take the university system, it's gone up about 60 times, from 20 universities to about 1,200 universities in these 75 years. That's a 60x expansion. College system has gone up even more. It's gone up by about 44 times, from about 1,000 colleges to 44,000 colleges. And I think the most dramatic thing is the two. Enrollment of that age profile was about 0.7%. It's slightly about 25% now. One-fourth of the children actually go to college at the college-going age. But of course, that compares quite poorly with other countries. I mean, 60 65% is common. Countries like South Korea go up to 80 85%. But if you look at the numbers in schools and co in colleges, it's also seen a dramatic jump from something like 2 lakh students in the university and college system at the time of independence. Today, we have crossed 4 crores. It looks good. But the challenge is in the future. With all these youth now going into college in future, we have two challenges. A population will increase for a while. will stabilize around 165 crores. That's what modeling show. And you also want the enrollment rate to go up from 27% to somewhere around 50-60% at least. The college-going student force would go up from about 4 crores to 8 or 9 crores. So you need 1,000 more universities from the 1,000 you have today. Alternatively, the 1,000 universities will have to accommodate twice the number of students that is there. So there's a huge opportunity and a huge challenge also. A lot of this, you see, the government system is constrained. And I know the preponderance of people here are actually from the private sector. The government system is choked. Now, government has a primary responsibility to provide education and health care. But when it comes to higher education, particularly, it's probably going to be a mix of both. Part of it is going to come from government, and part of it is going to come from the private sector. But there, there is an imbalance, because on the government side, well, the government of India is putting a lot of money in higher education, Bulk of higher education on the government side happens in the state sector, not in the central sector. So almost 40% of the money in education now is coming from government of India, but 75% of the students who go to colleges are in state universities. That's the interesting point. And if you add a, a couple of more other variations about state-recognized universities and all, it's 95%. So the 
states are fiscally strained. They do not have the capacity. If you go to any state government and see what they're doing in universities, they're paying salaries. The budget outside salary is about 5%. So you'll see that there is no R&D, there is no equipment, there is no capacity expansion, there are no facilities, no hostels. Where will this all come? It'll come from the private sector. So I'm extremely happy that, you know, over these two days, a lot of things are going to be discussed in this uh, workshop. And I've, I've seen the themes that you're going to discuss over the next two days. SDGs, uh, globalizing higher education, innovation and entrepreneurship, ed tech, quality assurance, social responsibility. I think these are the six themes which are going to be, you know, debated over the next two days. Each and every one of them is very, very important. But I would like to throw out some points which you should think through in, in different sessions as we go along. First, which I mentioned, is the challenge of numbers. We will have to go from about four crore children in the college university system to nine crores. How are we going to do it? I think this is there. And this is a big, big question. Are you going to have, you know, double the number of government universities? I don't know whether state governments have the capacities. How many new state universities have come up in the last 20 years? Nothing remarkable. You have a lot of IITs and IIMs, mind you, but they are a drop in the ocean. The big things actually are going to come from the private sector. At least half of this expansion from four to nine crores will happen in the private sector. So this is something to be seen. But then there's a second side to that same coin. Because if you don't do it the right way, a lot of these four or five crore additional children are going to go abroad for study. That's the international challenge you're facing. I mean, every year, I mean, the numbers vary depending on how you count, but about 13 lakh children go out of India to study. 13 lakhs. And we are spending, depending again on how you count, anywhere between six to eight billion dollars on education around the world. That almost matches government of India's expenditure on higher education in India. The question, and this is the big thing is, while the, state, the, the private sector can probably expand the university system to accommodate more, how are you going to get these high-paying students not to go abroad and come and stay in India? I'm sure there are great examples. I think my uh, uh, symbiosis on the diocese is one of those ones. You can think of many more names which are actually keeping children back in India. But I think it needs to be done on a much, much larger scale. And for that, you'll have to think, how do I increase my brand value? How do I increase my attractiveness? I mean, people don't go to education to get a degree. That's for government clerks. Because government has this condition, you have to have a BA. So they'll go to any college and get a BA somehow. The people are going to go to your colleges and are not looking for that. They're looking for skills and capacities which actually can be, make them employable in the private sector. So I think that's very, very important. How do I increase and improve my university's position to be employable? That's how this expansion will happen. So for me, internationalization in the sense of Indian students going abroad to study is your biggest threat. I mean, you go to South Bombay, Sobo as they say, or South Delhi, I think eight out of 10 kids are all writing SATs and whatnot, et cetera, and they're in the first flight away. So, but when sometimes I see one of some of these private sector campuses, I feel heartened that you are providing facilities on par with the best in the world, probably at one third or one fourth the cost. But it's not only the physical facilities, but it's also the academic facilities that need to be there, and they will certainly be then incentivized to stay back in India. And you know, that money will remain inside. After all, the Prime Minister, I think, Dave yesterday in Monkey Bath said that, you know, all these rich families don't go abroad to celebrate your marriages. There are enough venues in India, go to Udaipur, go to Himachal, go to some other part, and do your weddings in India. I mean, that money could actually be in India, and it'll employ a lot of people. So I think there is a need to look at this, the expansion of capacity. The second point, which my previous speaker, Shailesh, mentioned, is about actually getting your educational system revamped in a way that your students are industry ready. I've learned a lot in college, and I think it has helped me in my career a lot. It may not be exactly the courses I did, but it's the overall things that I learned. It doesn't matter. You may not apply it on day one, day two, but you will apply it at some point. And that's why companies still come to you to recruit. If universities were a waste, companies would recruit class 12 students and educate themselves. They can easily do it, but they still come to you, and that's it. I mean, uh, I was brainstorming with some people a couple of uh, days ago, automotive sector. And a lot of this automotive is in Pune and uh, Chennai. That's the two hubs, you know, and outside Delhi and CR. They do a lot of work. They say we engage the local engineering institutions to do a, train our employees and, you know, work with them. I said, look, 
What do those teachers know about modern manufacturing techniques, etc.? I mean, that stuff is there in your uh, factories. Colleges are not equipped to do all that. They said, no, the students need a theoretical background. So the colleges do the theoretical background. We teach them the latest manufacturing techniques on plant. So I think we need to be more innovative. You know, which universities in India have a co-op program? I mean, does our UGC system allow people to take a year or two off, go to industry, work, and then come back? It's not there in India. I may be wrong. I mean, there may be one or two which are doing it. We do it as internships. A co-op program is actually you take a full semester or two off, work, and come back. All good universities have that kind of a system in technical education. It could be there in MBAs also. We you take a year off, work, and come back, and that counts for your credits. So, you know, these are the kind of stuff which makes your student changing your curriculum. I know it's, it's a challenge, but since you're all in universities, I think you have freedom in bringing your curriculum online, and, and that's the second. The third thing is, and this is very important, technology is going to blow up your sector. And I'm, I'm saying that in a very deliberate way. It's going to be changed in manners you actually cannot imagine sitting in this hall. You have seen this whole revolution of edtech, which is about online learning, etc. You have seen the pros and cons my previous speaker said. It's going to be much, much more than that. What AI, machine learning, and all are going to do to education, I mean, how do you prevent your students actually from giving you homework, which actually they haven't done, but a chat GPT has done. This is it. Coding now is going to be there uh, as a part of their you know, uh, um, toolkit, which can be done online and come back. So these are going to be big challenges. I can actually, I mean, AI is being used in UAE in education. So this is going to come in a big way into your campuses. And you will have to get ready. It's going to be the next wave. I mean, I would like actually FIKI and the education uh, vertical in FIKI to have a separate day somewhere on how is AI going to affect the education system. It will affect you on the teaching side. It will affect you on the student side. It will affect you on the employability side. There are going to be jobs which are going to vanish, but there will be new jobs that we created. So I think this is something everybody, this is the coming wave. And we in government are terrified. Governments across the world are terrified about this. Not terrified about mankind being doomed, but terrified about how it will change our ways of working. So we need to be ahead of the curve. The other thing is, it's there as a session, innovation and entrepreneurship. I mean, this is something where I think we can have a genuine cause of complaint. Uh, slightly in the government sector, but quite a lot in the private sector also, as far as education is concerned. You know, we have all these buzzwords about experiential learning, creating an atmosphere where there is innovation. There is a big problem in our ecosystem, and that's related to both innovation as well as R&D. The way India has developed since 1947, R&D has not developed in the university system. We have created isolated pillar called CSIR. So you have DST, DBT, DA, DA, Department of Earth Sciences. It's all happening in labs which have nothing to do with universities. Whereas you go to Berkeley, you'll have the Fermi lab there. You go to Stanford, you'll get something there. You go to MIT, you get something there. The best research, be it science or non-science subject, or the fine arts, is actually happening in the university system. In India, unfortunately, it's got divorced. So our R&D system suffers because it has no touch with reality in terms of what's happening in the educational side. The education system doesn't benefit from the research. In one of the reasons for the ranking of Indian universities is low is because on the R&D side, we rank very, very low as far as universities are concerned. I think there is a need to bring these back again together. Extremely important. And here I'll make an offer. I'm told that there are a lot of white channels in the room. Niti has a very, very, very small budget for research. We surrender 80% of it. If anybody wants to do a research on any non-science and technology project, please send a letter to me. Fiki can give the email. We'll look at it, and we'll fund a professor or two to do something in any of the social sciences, be it impact assessment. This is an open offer. I have made it. We have called a lot of uh, you know all the known institutions, as we said, you know the known suspects, the career, NCAR, IGIDR, everybody. We have called some local Delhi based channels. Everybody is here. Please send off. We want to promote more research in social sciences here. We have the budgets. We will do it. It will help you. It will help you come out with papers. It will help government, because we'll give you topics which are relevant to you know, uh, government policy making also. But coming back to the innovation thing, the best innovation in the world is actually happening in educational cities. You have the Boston hub, half a dozen universities, an ecosystem which actually promotes uh, 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 trial and error, and also the financing. 
So you got the San, San Francisco belt which is there. So San Jose, etc. Again, good universities, a culture of startups, financiers, entrepreneurs, everything there. You have something in and around Cambridge. It has taken root in Bangalore. It's happening. And it's a totally different atmosphere. I can put my last rupee. A child who enters college at the age of 18 or 19, he goes to college in Bangalore and he goes to college in, say, I'm thinking random Jaipur. They will come out very different. The Bangalore guy will be thinking day in and out, how do I do a startup? Because that ecosystem is there. They're discussing every day at dinner, at breakfast, and on the holidays. In Jaipur, they'll be thinking, how will I get my job? You see, they're very different ecosystems. We need to create educational cities in India where R&D happens, colleges are there, and startups are there. I run in Niti Atal Innovation Mission. That's our job. So we've actually infiltrated about 10,000 schools in the country with Atal Tinkering Labs. It's about 3D printers and a lot of things, etc. The core purpose there is to actually, not that they will be great entrepreneurs. I mean, they've come out with a lot of nice, interesting stuff. One or two have actually patented it and gone ahead. But the whole idea is to create a scientific temper among the youth so that people shouldn't be afraid. You know, I, some of the older people will remember when Rajiv Gandhi first introduces computers in government offices, they used to be nicely on a desk with a plastic cover. Nobody would touch it, you know. You need to break the ice. And then children learn to play with gadgets early on in life. They become more savvy. But the second part, we fund incubation centers. We have funded about 100 utter incubation centers across the country. The whole idea is we need more of those. I think universities should think of that. We're going into, we're no longer funding any more incubation centers because I think it's an established model. We told the higher education department, you take it up so that now you fund 100 a year because the model is set. But we're going in different ways. We're going into vernacular incubation centers because we need incubation in local languages also. We are looking at deep tech, funding that, creating that ecosystem. After understanding it, we'll hand it over to a department to group. But I think universities can think of that. Anybody wants to look at incubation in, in some new ways, please write to our Atil Innovation Mission. There's a mission directly there from outside the government. And that, I think that'll be there. The, the, now I'll address the last issue, which I said earlier, and then, then I'll end, which is about internationalization. I look at internationalization a different way. There are two things here. India is going to be the provider of the largest workforce in the world for the next 25 years. In a couple of years, we're going to be one-fifth of the world's working age population. Working age. The only other place which is going to rival India in terms of producing working age people is Africa. People don't realize Africa as a whole has a less lower population than India. In a couple of years, they'll overtake us. That'll be the other youthful part of the world other than India. So we, I think that should be one of the goals of the university system in India. And it's not just the university, non-university, the skilling system also. Equipped our students to take up jobs around the world. India's oil import bill is equal to the remittances that come from around the world. That actually sees that our trade doesn't go haywire. So we are going to be the workforce around the world, nurses, doctors, lawyers, engineers. We are there. This is a global factory of good quality employees. And I think that's something we should look at. I mean, Piku could even think of creating an industry group or an education setup group, which, which can actually hunt for skills needed around the world and then funnel it back to the universities so that universities can train students with skills for the future. What is short? I'm telling you, US has gone for massive semiconductor production. I mean, just, this is news. I read Washington Post. I learned that. So you know, all this thing about French shoring, near shoring, let's get out of China, Taiwan, wherever, and get your semiconductor. They don't have semiconductor manufacturing engineers. And to train a semiconductor manufacturing engineer is six years. So the factory will come with no workers. This is a crisis. So they've gone on a crash program to increase the number of people. So actually, if there is a scanning of the horizon, it can help the university system prepare students for jobs that are needed around the world. I've negotiated an Australia free trade agreement. And what I realized there is there is a hunger for Indian skills in many areas. You will not believe cooks, farmers. The UK FTA, which has started, is about to get concluded. They need for nurses, doctors. The NHS will collapse without Indian nurses. So the huge, the second part of internationalization for us is we would like to have more and more foreign students coming to India. The two big hubs in India for foreign students coming to India and study are Pune and Chandigarh. These are the, actually the most, a bit in Bangalore, but these two are the hubs. We need more of that. Our goal 
And we are preparing a NITI, a vision for 2047. A lot of the stuff we are actually, I'm talking of, we are trying to address. And sometime in January or so, the Prime Minister will release the vision, what we call Vikasit Bharat in 2047. Education has a separate role in it. And one of the things we are targeting is that by 2047, we should have half a million foreign students in India, five lakhs. We should become a global provider of education. How will that happen? That will happen if we improve our quality, if we improve our brand value, we are globally recognized for what we provide, and we improve our rankings. I was again chatting, you know. Our NRF rankings are of a type, but we need rankings which are globally recognized. I mean, you have a Times Higher Education Index, you have that QS ranking, the Chinese didn't like the board, they set up their own ranking, by the way, which is now global. Everybody sees that also. It's called Shanghai something, I guess, or whatever. Why doesn't there be, a, you know, in a, a Bharat ranking or whatever, we start also ranking the Harvard and the Stanford from our perspective. And then we do it. I mean, that's a thought which I'm leaving aside. Let's see how we carry it forward. But we should be targeting foreign students to come to India. After all, we have a very good teaching culture. And the large parts, I'm not saying that the Americans and the Europeans are going to come to India. But what is the other continent is as big as India in population? It's Africa. You've got Southeast Asia. You've got Central Asia. They will all probably come to India if we actually expand our system, do a good job. English is the dominant language of the world. And that's whatever it is, we like it or not, it's an inherited advantage, you know. Probably if the French had colonized us, we would have been talking different. We speak a language which the computers speak. You know, the, 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 the biggest thing is coding is done in English. Okay, so we've had an unfair advantage historically now. But let's leverage that, become a global powerhouse in education, both for domestic students and for international students, and then we'll realize our vision of a Vikasit Bharat. Wish you all the well. Outstanding topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for your inspirational inaugural address. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now invite Professor Sombrik Bhattacharya, co-chair FIKI Higher Education Committee and senior vice president TCG Crest to kindly close the proceedings of the inaugural session with his words of thanks. Um, dignitaries on the dais and distinguished delegates and dignitaries of the dais, uh, good morning. Ah, what a start. So, on behalf of the FIKI Higher Education uh, Summit 2023 team, I stand before you with a heart full of gratitude and immense satisfaction the way the first session is going to be closed now. It has been an extra extraordinary inaugural session and setting the tone for what promises to be an enriching and impactful summit this year in its 18th edition. First and foremost, I extend our sincere appreciation to Sri BVR Subramaniam, CEO Niti Ayog, for gracing this occasion with your presence and, and uh, delivering the keynote address. Um, your vision for the future of education and dedication to driving transformation is, they are truly inspiring. Let me respond to a couple of things you mentioned. Uh, uh, take this opportunity and, and liberty. Uh, yesterday evening, we were discussing uh, about spending a day on this, this higher education committee on education and AI and generative AI. We did that. I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned it. I think this will accelerate the thought process and make it happen very soon, maybe in the next couple of months, within the next couple of months for, for sure. Uh, I also respond to the mention of, uh, you mentioned that cooperative uh, you know, co-op co uh, uh, part in the curriculum. Um, uh, at least one institute I know of, I've worked in, uh, uh, this, this is practiced, it's called practice school, a full semester of uh, practicing what uh, knowledge has been earned in the industry, you know, 22 weeks, and, and it, it brings in tremendous value. I think it's a wonderful model that the rest of the country could, could learn from. Uh, so it does happen in pockets, but it doesn't happen widely, that's true, in, in India, in higher education. Um, you know, we, were, uh, we are very honored to have you with us, and, and uh, I uh, also would like to, uh, uh, you know, thank you for mentioning the, some of the challenges, some of the future trends that, that we should be pursuing while our, our higher education sector uh, witnesses a 
huge growth that you, you mentioned. I'm, I'm glad uh, to hear the, the mention of the important role the private sector higher education is going to play in this growth scenario, in this national canvas for the years to come and, and currently doing as well. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I uh, uh, would like to uh, mention a special acknowledgement to, to Sri Ashutosh Gupta, uh, country manager LinkedIn, uh, whose thought-provoking address uh, delved into the image of India as a, you know, a talent powerhouse. I, I like that phrase, and it, it is true. It is true, and we, we from the campuses, we, we have seen uh, talents flowing out and, and helping the nation and beyond. Um, you know, your perspectives have undoubtedly ignited the imagination, I hope, of, to, of all those present here. Um, we have uh, a reservoir of uh, untapped potential you mentioned, I fully agree, and, and this is something uh, India should leverage on and, and do it correctly. The, the possibilities are infinite in my mind, and you, you mentioned it, I am I, uh, fully aligned on those thoughts. Uh, now the question is, are our campuses doing the right things to leverage on that? That's a, that's a burning question, and uh, many of us, uh, you know, we, we keep talking about it, but uh, there is no end to it. I, we must continue perfecting. We must continue uh, nurturing and developing the bright minds. Um, uh, Shailesh Pathakji, uh, I heard you last week in, in Calcutta in the National Executive Council meeting of FIKI, and uh, it was a pleasure to listen to you again. Thank you so much for gracing our, us with your presence. And, uh, you know, um, it was a pleasure again. And uh, I, I think uh, the soft skills, uh, you know, that needs to be uh, something that we sometimes, uh, uh, probably we are short of, uh, you know, uh, doing the right things on that. But I think uh, 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 Mr. Subramaniam also mentioned that the universities, uh, they prepare the base, the theories and, and so on, which is definitely useful, the hard skills uh, sometimes. Uh, but the soft skills are something, I think the universities are rising to the occasion. This is something new in you know last five, 10 years, uh, things are happening. But uh, I'm sure there are areas where we, we can do better. Uh, and the universities are not talking to the uh, industry while designing curriculum. It's partially true. I wouldn't say it's fully true, but uh, uh, but but we can do better. The conversations and the connections between uh, the industry folks, uh, along with the in university folks, should continue and should should happen in a better way. Uh, thank you, Vida, uh, for for uh, sharing your profound insights during this uh, welcome, uh, warm welcome address. Your commitment to shaping the future of higher education, particularly for the national canvas, leading the advocacy efforts on behalf of this committee, uh, is truly commendable. I, I loved, enjoyed uh, working uh, in this team under your leadership. Um, we noted your observation on the uh, teaching research uh, balance uh, that, that we should be uh, doing. Personally, I, I thought I could do a decent balance in, in my career, but along with many of our colleagues that we saw. But I think uh, in some institutes, it, it happens in, in an interesting and uh, uh, kind of desirable manner, but uh, it, it is uh, something we should pay attention to. Uh, I, I, I swear I have seen uh, from close quart quarters a large number of fabulous researchers are and legendary teachers, same person. So uh, it's not rare, it, it does happen it, in, in many institutes, but again, it doesn't happen very widely in this country, possibly, so we should pay attention to that. Our deepest appreciation to the team at FIKI and EOI for the release of the much-awaited uh, Knowledge Report 2023. This report is also a testament to collaborative research, if you will. Um, will un this will undoubtedly serve as a valuable resource for informed discussions and strategic planning at the uh, higher education, uh, in the higher education landscape. I thank all the summit partners uh, uh, um, listed over there uh, for their generous support. Uh, without your support, we couldn't have done it. All our distinguished speakers and attendees, your collective presence has not only enriched this inaugural session, but has set the tone for an inspiring summit. Wishing you all a summit filled with meaningful dialogues and, and transformative ideas and 
very importantly lasting connections. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a request. Um, uh, the request is uh, those of you who are mem not members of FIKI, please explore the idea and become one. It will be good for all of us. Thank you so much. Let me do a marketing job. I'm in the process of hiring a large number of people uh, for three years, five years, all kinds of stuff. So I will send, and we have cut out our recruitment process. It's round the clock, 24 by 7, 365 days. So, it's a, it's a, so I will send the, uh, the, the, the infographic to Shailesh. He will circulate it to the university system. Put it in your placement people and ask your children. Bachelors, masters, huge variety of fields. Science, technology in one end to history, geography and economics at the other end. I'm looking for about 300 people. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for the generous offer. And I'm sure it would be a very nice initiative that would be taken. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, thanking Honorable Chief Guest and all our eminent dignitaries on the desk. We close the proceedings of the inaugural function. And I would request uh, Honorable Chief Guest and dignitaries to kindly proceed towards the inauguration of the exhibition. And we also will take a short tea break, which will be of 30 minutes. I would request everybody to be seated back by 12 o'clock for the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, I would request everyone to kindly stay. Let our honorable chief guests proceed towards the inauguration of the exhibition first. Requesting everybody to kindly remain seated while our honorable chief guest proceeds towards the inauguration of the exhibition. Thank you. <laughs>